Hello, everybody, and welcome to Church in Maine. This is the podcast that's at the intersection of faith and modern life. My name is Dennis Sanders. I'm your host. I am a pastor of a church in Roseville, Minnesota, which is a suburb of Minneapolis and St. Paul. And uh, this is the podcast that I have been doing now for two years. It's gone through a few different name changes, but this is the one that that stuck. Um, and um, I'm glad to have you with me. So I kind of want to start this off by something that bothers me. Um, if you're like me and you're a pastor or someone professional, maybe, or just a long-term member of a mainline uh, Protestant denomination, so that could be the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, um, the Presbyterian Church USA, the United Church of Christ, the Christian Church, Disciple of Christ, which is my denomination, American Baptist Churches, Reformed Church in America. Um, I, think, I can't remember if I've said the Episcopal Church, but if I didn't say it, the Episcopal Church, United Methodist Church, you know that for as long as you've probably been a member or part of this denomination, that it's been in decline. And that has been just the case with a lot of these churches over the last 40, 50 years. And um, I don't know what it was like years ago, but it's funny over the years that you start to hear a certain way of how people talk about decline. Um, and basically the way that they talk about it is really in a way to try to ignore that there is decline going on and they try to put a good spin on it. Um, you know, this is just change of our culture. Um, things are changing. We just have to be open to that. And so, you know, you kind of deal with those conversations, but they're frustrating because no one really wants to kind of talk about the decline. Um, they don't, it's as if maybe if we talk about this, then bad things are going to happen. I, I don't know, but we kind of try to put as much of a spin on it. Um, sometimes I've heard when, especially there is our churches that are closing or there is a shortfall in a budget for the region, um, or if you're, in a, you know, uh, or in a synod that, you know, God is doing a new thing. And yes, God can do new things, especially in tightening uh, times and in period uh, when things are looking kind of um, chancy. But it feels at times that we're not being truthful. Um, and for a long, long time, I thought that I was crazy, that I was the only one that felt this way. Everyone else seemed to not have a problem with this. And then I read an article about a month ago, we're now almost two months ago, uh, from someone that helped me realize that maybe I'm not crazy, or at least I'm not crazy about this. You know? And um, it was an article called on why church decline conversations are so frustrating. Um, and the sub uh, heading is even more interesting. Or do we agree on whether or not it matters that people be Christians? The article was written by Ben Crosby. Ben is a... Um, ordained priest in the Episcopal Church, but he is living in the Great White North right now. He is actually getting a uh, PhD, I believe, in ecclesiastical history at McGill University in Montreal. And he wrote this article, which I found refreshing because he was really talking about um, kind of what I was feeling and as someone who is also concerned about um, the mainline church and wants to see it thrive and wants to see it continue in some form, 
Um, he also has, I think, an interesting view in that he is looking at it um, as a as an American, but also an American living in Canada. Um, and of course, Canada has its mainline um, denominations: um, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Canada, the um, Anglican Church of Canada, the United Church of Canada, uh, Presbyterian Church in Canada. And so they're they're dealing with some of the same issues. And in some ways, they're probably a little bit farther ahead, just because I think Canada is a lot more um, secular than um, we are here in the states. Um, some of you may agree with this if you hear this pod when we hear the podcast when we talk, and you may be nodding your head. Some of you th- may be hearing this for the first time, but I, I do hope that if you are hearing it for the first time, that you're open to what's going on. It's not. This is not a conversation about being defeatist. It is not trying to say that all hope is lost. But I think it is a conversation that is about trying to be honest about where the church is. Um, That this tradition, especially this tradition that I've been a part of now for 30 years, that we care about so much, is in trouble. And that if we want to see it continue in some form, We have to attend to some of the problems. And for that to happen, we have to actually admit there is a problem. So um, with that, we'll go into the conversation with uh, Ben Crosby. Well, Ben, thank you for taking the time to uh, chat with me. I know it's been trying to get this appointment and finding the time that works. So thanks for taking the time. No, it's absolutely my pleasure, Dennis. I'm really honored to be here. Sorry that it has taken us a little while to make this happen, but this is great. So I wanted to talk to you about the article that you wrote on your Substack um, back in January. And the title alone was fascinating um, to me because on why church decline conversations are so frustrating. <laughs> um, and it was fascinating because I agree. And mm. it always feels like this is a, um, as we were kind of saying before we started this, that I was crazy because yes. it didn't seem like everyone else had, were, were thinking about things like this in the same way. Um, and so it was refreshing to see that there are, there is someone that is thinking about that. I wish that this were found in more Mm. church judicatory bodies, but, um, not yet, but what led you to write that article? Um, and kind of your, and maybe that in some of that explain your own background. Yeah, no, that's a a great question. Um, So a little bit about me. Uh, I am a priest in the Episcopal Church, um, relatively relatively new one. I'm actually coming up on a uh, two days from now is my the uh, the year anniversary of my my ordination to the priesthood from from when we're recording this. Um, Grew up uh, in the in the states, um, uh, in the Midwest, um, as a member of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, so conservative Lutheran body. Um, in college, sort of made my way to the main line. Eventually, discerned that the Episcopal Church seemed to be where where God was calling me to to live and to minister. Um, so I'm currently actually serving in the Anglican Church of Canada um, in the Diocese of Montreal, where I am pursuing a, a PhD in religious studies at, at McGill University, um, where my research actually focuses on something entirely different. I'm a, a Reformation historian, so I, I do work on um, a couple of early Anglican thinkers, John Jewell and Richard Hooker, um, who are probably not particularly pertinent to this conversation today, but who knows, maybe I'll find a way to bring them in. Um, and in terms of, of that piece, I've written a couple of pieces, actually, for my for my substack on the question of, of church decline. And I, I think at the core where it comes from is, is exactly um, this, this experience that you mentioned of, of feeling like I am sitting here by myself, sort of tearing my hair out um, about the fact that we seem to be barreling towards 
a crisis. Frankly, are already in a crisis um, in in a lot of our mainline churches, um, and that I don't know how how should I put it. I mean, it's not. Yes, I guess it's, it's what you said that that other people don't seem to be concerned about it in the same way or for the same reasons. Um, and and I'm just sort of trying to get my head around for myself why that might be, what's going on with that, um, and how we might have conversations that feel more productive and generative about the future of our churches, or at the very least, understand why the conversations aren't so good that we're having. Hmm. So when you wrote it, you actually wrote that there were kind of like there were these two ways of, well, not two ways of looking at this, but two questions. Um, And I think the first one was basically, does Christianity matter? And if there are, are there other ways that people can, can kind of get meaning in their life? And then the second one is, is the church necessary for Christian faith or or for, for the Christian life? Um, Would you be kind of expound a little bit more on those two questions that you're asking? Yeah, no, absolutely. So I think it seems to me in having sort of sat in on a set of, of conversations about the future of the church um, in, in seminary um, as, a, as a priest before I was ordained as well, and, and sort of seeing how they play out um, in, in online conversations or in church publications, you know, it seemed to me that at least perhaps it's different answers to, to these questions that, that are driving some of the very different responses um, to the decline of the church, right? And on the first, yeah, I mean, I think the question is, is Christianity in at least some sense uniquely true? Are there things that one gets through Christianity that one cannot get elsewhere? Or on the other hand, is Christianity just one of a number of ways of, of making meaning in the world, of, um, of living a, a meaningful life, of, of, of you know, sort of, of, of what have you? Um, and at the risk of stating the obvious, you're concern about the decline um, of Christian affiliation in in the United States or in Canada um, is going to look very different based on how you answer that question, right? Like if you, if indeed Christianity is really true in in a specific way, well, then it it looks like it's a much bigger problem um, that our churches are emptying out than if you want to say, well, no, you know, Christianity is just one of a number of of sort of human meaning-making endeavors that one sees in the world. Why do you think that there are so many people that in some ways, well, it seems like in in some ways are in denial. Um, They don't want to really admit there's a problem um, when they, you talk about crisis, you'll say, well, we're not really in a crisis. Um, or maybe they'll say something to the effect of, and this really bothers me, God is doing a new thing. <laughs> I mean, why, what is it? It seems like the sense of, of talking about crisis is defeatist. And I don't think that talking about a crisis is can be defeatist. I think that just means we have to find a way of how to solve a problem, not, you know, that we're just giving up. Yeah. No, I'm 100% um, on the same page with you. And something that has shaped um, a lot of my thinking about this actually comes from before um, ministry, I was heavily involved, actually, as a, as a labor organizer, um, primarily with the, um, the Hotel Workers Union Unite Here. Um, and they, and so, you know, I have, I have, uh, I like to joke in a way that isn't exactly a joke, that I have spent a lot of my life around, you know, struggling, if in fact, um, failing um, institutions. Um, but one of the things that I found 
deeply moving actually about this union in particular is that in a place where uh, was, well, as, as I'm sure you know, as I imagine many of your listeners know, you know, the labor movement in the United States, um, really since the 80s, in some ways before that, um, has been in decline, by and large, that have been signs of life in some places, but the overall prognosis is is bleak. And one of the things that Unite Here had really figured out how to do was to grow in an environment where most unions weren't growing. And I think part of doing that from them was a realization um, from the the highest levels of that union on down that like, no, you know, you couldn't actually do, you couldn't actually keep on keeping on, you know, the, the status quo wasn't needed, wasn't working. There had to be some real attempts to, to try new things, to experiment, to sort of work boldly um, because they were driven by a deep, deep belief that it actually mattered whether or not workers were in unions. Um, and so, you know, I'm not saying that they're perfect or that the the example is is transferable in every single way, but it is true that it has a reputation as and then it has been one of the few unions in the United States that has managed to consistently grow to add new members year after year. Um, that doesn't exactly answer your question. Um, I apologize. I think in terms of like why the denial? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think some amount of it, um, not to be too cynical, but some amount of it is that there are a, a set of people who are indeed um, paid well, earning fine pensions um, in the in the world um, as it as it is. There are a set of people um, who just don't have incentives necessarily to do the kind of bold reimagining or at least reckoning with, um, you know, sort of things that they are, um, but perhaps more theologically, um, and, and I hope more, more generously or charitably. Um, so I said, I come from the, the Lutheran, uh, a Lutheran background. And then I think Luther's theology remains very important to me. Um, and I think one of his central insights that like, we, as he'll put it, we, we sort of hate, um, by nature, hate the law, that we, we don't like reckoning with the fact that we, by ourselves, by our own efforts, you know, are not good enough, are not measuring up, you know, cannot um, right the ship in our lives, never mind in our institutions. Like, that's not a fun thing to have to come to grips with, right? I think it's it's very hard <laughs> to look at a church that you have dedicated your life to in one form or another and to say what we're doing is failing. Um, I think it's a lot easier and, and healthier. Uh, health, sorry, not healthier. I think it is a lot easier um, and, and at most, at the first glance, more appealing to be able to find some way to say, well, no, no, you know, God is just doing a new thing. No, no, we're not really in crisis. This is just, you know, the spirit is moving in, in brave new ways. And it's, it's much harder to say, no, actually, we are dying. We are dead. We need resurrection. But I think that's the thing that we actually need to say, because that's what's honest. It's interesting you said that about resurrection. Um, is it because, well, which makes me wonder, is, is the fear then that if we say that we're dead, are we worried that we can't be resurrected? Yeah, that's a good question. I, that's a good question. I think it might, I mean, for all that we like to talk about, you know, how the story of the church is always one of resurrection to sort of let ourselves off the hook for, for, for kind of encountering the reality of our current brokenness and deadness. I do wonder if that's exactly right, that there might be a, a fear that, um, that if we admit we're really dead, we will just die. So, I guess the, the question to me is, you know, why does it matter to have these conversations, to be honest? Um, it, you know, if you were talking to a, ch a church executive, a bishop, um, a regional minister, 
what would you tell them that why we need to have some truth telling? Um, because I think in some ways it, it, there, that is part of the problem is that mm. we aren't really being honest with ourselves and honest um, to people in our congregations that here's a problem, but also to offer the sense of hope that God can do something and has done something mm -hmm. with things that are dead. Yeah, that's I, that's a great question. Um, I think if I were having this conversation with, as you say, someone in that position, I mean, I think I would want to say some version of, you know, first of all, we like the consoling stories that we are telling about things, everyone knows that they're not actually true, right? Like if there was a point in which you could sort of slap a new um, coat of metaphorical paint on things and try to try to sort of convince each other and convince ourselves that things are okay, like those days are, are done. You know, when I talk to, to sort of other young people, um, <laughs> young being defined in the mainline way as anyone under their, I don't know, 50, 55, something like that. Um, clergy and laity, you know, we can all see the writing on the wall. We all know um, that the institutions that we have um, are not going to exist in the same form at the end of our lives. Um, you know, these are our conversations that we are already having amongst ourselves. And so I think there is sort of no, if there was ever a sort of benefit towards this, this kind of, I don't know, manic glass half full optimism. Um, I think that moment is past. Um, and then I think theologically, I mean, it's, it's sort of what I was saying before that, um, you know, we have a God, on one hand, we don't need to be afraid because we have a God who raises things from the dead and um, raises people from the dead. Um, and on the other hand, um, you know, to speak perhaps in a, in a very specifically Protestant theological key for a moment that, that it is only when we admit that we cannot fix ourselves, save ourselves, set ourselves aright, that we can actually receive the grace that God is freely offering us. That there's no, um, you know, there's actually, um, this does, uh, reminds me of actually a quote by a, a Catholic um, theologian, a Dominican, Herbert McCabe, who says something like, the truth of the crucifixion is that, you know, only those who are able to look on the truth of human history as a tortured body and sort of look at that unflinchingly, like only for them, is there a possibility of like dramatic transformation of resurrection? Um, and I'd probably want to say a little bit more about both what the crucifixion, what the resurrection mean than that, but I certainly wouldn't want to say less than that. Mm -hmm. hmm. And so I'm kind of curious. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, that was Terry Eagleton, um, a, an Irish cultural critic who is um, sort of playing with some ideas of, McCabe, of McCabe's, but I think that's actually an Eagleton quote. Or it, well, anyway, we might have to cut this section out. I apologize. I can, I can look up after this um, who the quote is actually by and send it to you. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. That's okay. What does it, you know, when people talk about institutions, and especially in, in our business, sometimes we want to even downplay that the church is an institution, um, even though I th think it is. Um, so what is the importance of the church as an institution in our society? Um, and is are our current leaders really, do they see that importance or do are they again, kind of blind to that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I know that's, you know, one of the, one of the particular focuses of, of your podcast here is the kind of interaction between the, the church and the, the broader society. And I mean, to put, to put my historian's hat on for, for a second, I mean, I think, 
we are certainly living through a pretty dramatic transformation in the place of the church within quote unquote Western societies that is probably unprecedented in importance since the Reformation, if not since Constantine or Theodosius or what have you, that, you know, for for a long time, for good and for ill, and I think it is for good and for ill, you know, the, the church, Christian concepts, Christian ideas were the both the kind of mental structure and, and in a lot of cases, the the social institutions around which our societies were structured. And now, even if the the kind of after effects of Christian ideas and commitments in secularized forms continue to, I think, be, be incredibly important to understanding the society we live in today. Like the churches as specific institutions aren't pay, playing the same social structuring role that they were in. And I think, I suspect at least, and, and this I, is, is, is sort of my own, take it for what it's worth, and, and I'd be interested in your thoughts as well, that part of why the mainline in particular has been hit so hard by the secularization of the last half century or so is that these were exactly the churches that saw themselves as the guardians of the of the social order, as as, as those who who were, I mean, many of these churches are, you know, the ones that, that that historians will call magisterial Protestant, which means the the Protestant churches that were supported by and and themselves supported the state, right? And so I think, you know, we find ourselves in this in this sort of odd position of of having for centuries our self understanding wrapped up in forming certain sorts of citizens in 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 being. Um, in a way that I think is is less true in in sort of more evangelical or more kind of revival orient revivalist oriented churches um, that that I suspect um, yeah I wonder if that's that's part of why that I wonder if that I do wonder if that is part of why decline has hit us so hard and I think that so much of our reaction in in sort of throwing all in in um, and then sort of staking our relevance on social action, social justice work. Um, while a lot of churches do a lot of very good work that I'm, I'm by no means demeaning, um, but I think that it often, in a weird sort of way, ends up just kind of reflecting or being a kind of funhouse mirror version of this, this earlier vision of the church as this sort of institution that is that is shaping a social imaginary or, or something like that right that like you know <laughs> we still think that it matters what the presiding bishop of the episcopal church says about xyz worthy cause and, and don't get me wrong i pretty much always agree with what the presiding bishop of the episcopal church is saying about that particular cause but no one, it doesn't matter, right? Like the, 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 the sort of church as the kind of moral voice of a broader society, um, that moment is, is not our moment right now, um, which means that I think we need to be refocusing on the business of making disciples, forming disciples, the kind of basics, basic ABCs of the Christian life, um, because if my time in the labor movement um, taught me anything, you know, all of the like good words, um, shining rhetoric in the world doesn't mean a thing if you don't have people by your side. And increasingly, we just don't have those people. Yeah, I think that there is, and, you know, there are different ways of looking at institutions. And I think for mainline churches, I, I would agree that the the way that we've looked at, inst at institutions in that way is that they were kind of the guardians of the culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really helpful way of putting it. Um, and, you know, they were um, kind of the ones that, you know, people ended up on covers of Time magazine or things of mm -hmm. that extent. Um, and for a lot of different reasons, that isn't the case anymore. Um, so then what does that mean? And I think then, you know, 
I think one thing to learn from evangelical churches is that they saw their role as an institution because they weren't in the centers of power, that it was more about shaping people, which that's right. A fancy way of saying discipleship, making discipleship. That's right. Um, and it seems like that has to be our new role is yes. not about guarding the culture, um, thinking at, because, uh, you know, thinking that the culture itself will is, is nominally Christian, but to be kind of making disciples in a culture, in a more secular culture. Um, yes. But that seems also a challenge because we're not, we haven't done that well, or at least haven't done that well for quite some time. That's right. No, I think that's right. And I think one of the, one of the challenges, I think, for our church in thinking about things like discipleship is I, at least as I have experienced, I think a lot of mainline identity is very reactive um, and, and specifically is reactive against people's often genuinely very bad and difficult and wrong experiences in more conservative forms of Christianity. Um, and I think it is a good and holy thing that our churches make room for for healing, for reconnection with God, for people who have often been deeply burned and traumatized by their experiences in other sorts of churches. Like, I want to underline that. I think that's good. But I think that simply being whatever evangelicals aren't is not actually a sustainable or particularly coherent, you know, way, way forward. And so, I mean, you'll hear on, on things like, well, yes, on, on things like discipleship, like, oh, you know, we, well, we, we can't be asking people to do X, Y, or Z thing because that's, you know, that's what evangelicals do, or we can't be telling other people about Jesus. That's what evangelicals do. Um, and I think, I think the way that we do discipleship and the way that we do evangelism is going to look different in some ways from the ways that our evangelical siblings do it. But I think that the call, the call is still there. Um, and I think conceding a monopoly on like forming serious Christians to other parts of the church is just really shooting ourselves in the foot. <laughs> Yeah, I think long term that's not helpful. I think one of the things that I have long believed in, in um, and like you, I think that the mainline church is important, um, and especially for speaking from my own experience of being gay, it's mm -hmm. very important. Um, but I remember, and I've always thought this, and I've actually wrote about it too, is like when we have this movement for more inclusion, especially of LGBTQ people in the church, my old question is, what are we, what are we being inclusive for? Yes. You know, there is a reason that we are including people into the church. It, it's not simply because it's a cool thing to do, or mm. you know, the other answer I hear is that Jesus was inclusive, so we mm -hmm. should be too. Okay, but Jesus also asked people to follow him. I mean, That's right. You know, it wasn't simply, hey, you know, we're all going to be, you know, United Colors of Benetton or something. <laughs> you know, communion. But, um, but that there is a reason why we do that. And, mm. and I think our, our, what discipleship and evangelism, as you say, will look like in our context is not going to be what it is in evangelical context. And that's, not slamming their context. It's just mm -hmm, that it's mm -hmm. different because we have different ways. But as you said, I think the call is still there. Um, no, but, I think that's I think that's exactly right. And I mean that's that is one of the reasons that a a vibrant Jesus centered mainline is so important to me that I think that women deserve to be, be sort of fully welcomed into ministry that LGBTQ people, you know, deserve to be, to be invited to marriage to ordination, if that's their call. Um, not just because, well, all of this is kind of fake and made up anyway. And so, you know, sure, why not? You're welcome. But because 
because we have Jesus, because we want to invite you into a, a life transforming relationship where you can bring all of yourself into relationship with God in such a way that, as you say, means getting up and following Jesus means, means changing everything that I think, I think that both inclusion and renewal alike are so vital because this isn't just about, well, the church should be inclusive because every institution should be inclusive. I mean, sure, I, I think that's true, but like the church should be inclusive because we are not the only way that God can work, but a way that God has appointed through word, through sacrament, through Christian community to draw people into the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, you, and you talked earlier about your labor organizing and kind of re relating these two experiences. Um, I don't come from a labor organizing background, but both mm -hmm. my parents were um, retired. They're um, auto workers. So I'm oh, amazing. United Auto Workers mm -hmm. here in the States. Um, and you talked a little bit about how um, there is a certain amount of accountability that what are you doing to kind of grow the movement? Um, mm -hmm. Whether that's, and so, which is, I guess, you know, why unions put so much into um, union organizing because that's right. that is the way that you grow the movement, even, even in this day and age where it seems like the unions are not as strong as they used to, at least the private sector ones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you've also kind of related that to um, judicatory leaders and that we don't hold them to that kind of accountability. And no, you don't want to get it to a point of, well, you know, we've made this many disciples or planted this many churches. <laughs> But I, I guess, could you kind of expound upon that a little bit more about yeah. how do we hold people accountable as, as leaders, even as pastors, to kind of trying to grow the church in some way? No, I think that's, I think that's a great question. And right, I mean, this is, this is at least for the unions that are still growing. I mean, this is how it looks. It's if you're a union organizer, you know, you have your, your meeting with whoever is, is, you know, your sort of supervisor every week. And it's how many conversations did you have? What were the outcome of those conversations? You know, like things are, and, and I'm not saying that that is the degree to which we need to be like tracking the activities of our, of our ministers, or for that matter of our, um, you know, sort of judicatory leaders, so I don't know exactly what it should look like, but it it really does strike me that at least as far as I can tell, there's nothing at all now, right? I mean, you know, every once in a while, a church will, um, you know, either at the, the the diocesan or sort of equivalent middle judicatory level or, or at a, a kind of higher level, will will give out a goal for, you know, X new disciples in so many years, X church planted in so many years. The goal won't be met. We all kind of knew from the beginning that the goal wouldn't be met. Nothing will really happen about that one way or another. And then, um, you know, a few years later, the new goal that will be smaller, but still not actually reachable, you know, will be trotted out and not met. And it's um, it's tremendously disheartening. And I mean, it just feels, I don't know, it feels to me at least often like there's sort of an air of, of unreality about the whole thing that we're kind of playing at accountability at all levels, even though we know that it's like, that there's not actually going to be any. So, so I don't know. I, I I don't know if I have a great answer. I remember I was reading um, something that I have found helpful um, to to my own thinking about evangelism in particular. Was there was uh, do you know the name of this? There was a, a Lilly funded study um, probably about a decade ago, maybe a decade and a half about. Um, about sort of looking at kind of evangelism best practices in the mainline. Um, do, do you know what I'm talking about? Do you remember who put this together? That sounds very familiar. And I can't oh, remember. It's, it. it's at the tip of my tongue. Um, I, anyway, um, but one of the pieces of advice that I remember that, that they gave that they found that some middle judicatory body had done and done very successfully is like each year at annual convention, you know, there was a, um, I think like a, a, 
a show of hands or people were invited to share how many adult baptisms they had had in their congregation that year. And it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't at all a, a punitive thing, right? Um, but just the chance to like, that everybody knew every year this conversation was going to be happening and you got to see which churches were actually able to sort of attract new disciples. The idea being that, that adult baptisms are, are probably going to be people being brought in with the the least possible, with the sort of people being brought in that are probably actually new Christians, that aren't just people that are that are sort of jumping over from another another church, but are actually people that weren't Christians before, um, at least in bodies that that baptize infants, which, which you know, the body in question was one. Um, and that just knowing that that was something that was going to be talked about every convention, knowing that you were going to have a chance to, to share successes and like get in touch with the people who are successful to sort of share best practices, that just something as little as that, um, they said, like increased pretty dramatically the number of adult baptisms in that judicatory body. That so, you know, big... yeah, I mean, just to like be saying, be, be saying, be making it clear in, in all of the communications that are going out that things like this are our priorities, celebrating people that are doing it. Like, it's not going to be the like one cool trick to fix every problem, but it'd be something. But at least it might say that this is important. That's that right. This and I think too often we don't do that. Um, That's right. So have you, in, in kind of your observations, seen churches or bodies that are out there that are doing something that's a little bit different, that are, are being a little bit more truthful and saying, hey, this is a problem? Um, and, you know, one of the few things that I have read over the last few years um, was from two professors at the time were both from Luther Seminary. Mm. Um, one of them is an Episcopal priest, um, had talked about the fact was, you know, would the Evangelical Lutheran Church be around in 30 years? Yes. It, it was a kind of a, obviously a very, um, you could say clickbaity title, mm -hmm. but, it, but it was, I think it got the point across. Yeah. But, you know, are there people out there churches, professors, thinkers that are actually kind of being a little bit more honest and maybe wanting to say we need to be, we, we, we need to change. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a, a very good question. Um, I was struck by, and I, I'm, I'm, I'll say right out the outset that I, I don't know a lot of the details of this situation. It's something that I've sort of heard through the, um, kind of through the ecclesial grapevine, as it were, but there's a, a diocese of the Anglican Church of Canada um, far out west, um, and they just sort of put out a report that basically said, the current diocesan structures are dead. Like we are on palliative care for our existing congregations. We are trying to be honest about that and discern, you know, which of our bodies might still sort of be capable of doing healthy ministry going forward, even while we figure out how to continue to provide care and sacraments to those parts of our institutional life that are dying. And I remember just being like, wow, like that, that was really impressive to me, frankly, um, that, that people were willing to, to engage in that level of, of truth telling about their state. And I, you know, I don't know what will happen as a result of this sort of process that they are currently in, embarked on. I, I pray for them. Um, but I think I remember reading that and thinking, wow, like this is, this is the sort of thing that we need more of. Um, you know, in some ways, um, Canada, the, the sort of secularization is a little further along in Canada than in the United States. Right. So I, I think it's, um, Assuming that the U.S. you know will will continue to follow a secularizing trajectory, which seems like it will, at least based on uh, you know what what demographers can can predict. Um, so I think it, in some ways it's maybe a little a little easier to be honest because because we're just that much further along. Um, I think that frankly, 
there is a real opportunity that I pray a lot of our church bodies in the States take while we still do have some money, some members, some infrastructure to recognize where things are going and see if we can't like chart a new path while we still do have resources to put into that new path. Um, I mean, I think there's a whole nother conversation um, to have that I am not the right person to have. I have sort of very uninformed lay thoughts about it that has to do with, you know, how the actual, like the, how the actual polities of our denominations often seems to make the sorts of changes that I'm talking about quite difficult to happen, right? I mean, just in terms of where decision making lies, um, where where power lies, who has control of what resource. Um, like, I think there are a lot of institutional difficulties standing in the way of, like that. That even with the sort of best wills in the world, it's 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 difficult um, to to sort of make these kind of creaky institutions of ours function, um, but. But I do hope and pray that we'll be able to to try at least more than we are now. And I do think that it starts with um, with the sort of truth telling that that this diocese was doing. Mm-hmm. So, what advice would you give to a pastor that sees things around them that aren't going well, and they want to kind of say something? And just don't always feel that they can, or, or, in as in my situation, sometimes feel that you're the only one that feels this way, or that you're crazy, or something to that extent. What kind of message of hope would you give them? Yeah, gosh, that's such a good question, and. You know, I got to be honest with you, Dennis. It's it's a lot easier to uh, to point out the problems than uh, than than to suggest um, you know what the ways are forward. Um, and you know, I think um, frankly, I feel keenly um, my own sort of relative pastoral inexperience when it comes to to giving advice. Um, which is all to say that take this is for what it's worth and it might not be worth very much. Um, but I know for me, you know, talking to this, this hypothetical pastor, first of all, finding other people, a clergy or lay leaders who see things the way you are, the way you do, is super vital to feeling like you are sane. Um, so if you can do that, if it's on social media, if it's through whatever sort of clergy associations exist, either denominationally or locally, you know, I think that's super important. Um, and then, I mean, I think increasingly, I think this is true, that putting a brave face on things for your people isn't actually fooling any of them. And so the extent to which you can like release yourself of the obligation to have to be like the cheerleader, that seems to me to be a helpful thing to do because your people know just as much as you do that, you know, young families aren't coming to your church, that the budget is shrinking every year while, you know, while costs are going up. Um, And then finally, our hope isn't in ourselves. Our hope is in God. And and we don't, we aren't promised success in this work, right? You know, I I think, I really wish it'd be, it'd be really nice that there was, you know, a a very clear, um, you know, hours put in, um, you know, output in, in souls, one for the kingdom or whatever, Um, you know, sort of, sort of life in, um, uh, yeah, sort of, sort of relationship in, in ministry. But uh, as I'm sure, you know, you know far better than I do. Um, you know, that's that's not always the case. Um, but we are called to f- be faithful, and we are called to be faithful to a God who raises the dead. And I think, in the end, that is my hope for the church that God has promised. Not that any one in particular institutional instantiation of the church will will endure forever. I you know I don't think that there is a, a promise in Holy Writ that there will be an Episcopal church until you know Jesus return in glory. But that, however it will look, 
the gates of hell won't prevail against the church because it is ultimately run by the Holy Spirit, not thanks be to God, by us. I don't think I need to add anything more to that. (laughs) Good way to kind of close things out. So um, if people want to talk to you more um, on social media or other web uh, websites, are there any places people can find you? Yeah, the best place um, to read my writings is uh, my Substack, which is bencrosby.substack.com. Um, you're more than welcome to, to check out my writings there and, and see if it's of interest and you want to give me a follow. Um, you can also find me commenting on Twitter at Benjamin D. Crosby altogether. Um, you can find me on Facebook um, where I, I do some writing as well um, under, under my name, Ben Crosby. All right. Well, Ben, thank you for taking the time. This is this has been hopeful, and I mm. think it's it. Um, and I always like to use the word hope over optimism. Yes, because um, I think that there is something about that. Um, there's something godly about hope. Yeah. So thank you for this hopeful message. Well, thank you so much for for having me on for all that you do with this podcast and all that you do for the Lord in general. All right. Take care.